Dr. Sonia Cunningham Leverett, and she is an Amazon best-selling author pursuing her passion of uplifting, informing, and healing through words. Her publications are as follows. She has children's book, BJ's Big Dream, What Is That Stinky Winky Ew Smell?, he never slumbers. My friends lived in the outlet. Oh, to be a bulldog. And Ulysses Cunningham, a friend to man, the story of a soldier and steward. Short stories published in anthologies by Vanessa Miller. A Thanksgiving Christmas diary of a husband finder. Dr. Leverett has published the books of five other authors. She's a graduate of Clemson University and South Carolina State University. And she has served as an English teacher school and district administrator, assistant superintendent, and adjunct professor in her 30-plus years of service in the field of education. Dr. Leverett was honored along with five other community servants by Friendship AME Church, Clinton, South Carolina, doing a weekend or a women's weekend celebration. That was back in 2017. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Reading Circle Microphone, Dr. Sonia Cunningham Leverett. Dr. Leverett, good morning again. Good morning, and thank you so much for allowing me to be your guest this morning. Well, I'll tell you what, thank you so much for being my guest this morning. I was looking on LinkedIn, because I'm on LinkedIn a lot, out out of all of the various social media sites, I think now LinkedIn and Instagram I'm on the most. At one point it would be Facebook, but I think those two have surpassed it. And I saw you would put something about the latest book or something or another, and I said, oh, I got to get her on the show. That was one thing. But secondly, we have a whole lot in common. <laughs> As I read your bio, we have a lot in common. And I'm, I don't know if you're old enough to remember the O.J. Simpson trial or not, but there was a, <laughs> there was, there was a point in there whenever... F. Lee Bailey talks to, I think it was Mark Furman, whenever he says, we're going to talk Marine to Marine. Well, this morning, we're going to talk educator to educator. (laughs) Exactly, exactly. I noticed that in your profile. Are you currently serving as a principal? Yes, I am. That's that's amazing. It is. It is a lot. I have 400 plus students. I have elementary and a middle school. I have a combination of both. I go from grades two to eight. Okay, elemental. Yes, yeah, exactly. So <laughs> we have a lot in common in terms of being adjunct professors. Actually, in terms of your English teacher, that's what I was. I taught eighth grade language arts whenever I was teaching and uh, still teach communications and public speaking and the adjunct level. So, yeah, we have a lot to talk about. All right. <laughs> all right. So, all right. I, one of my first questions I do kind of ask is kind of like, where did it all begin? Because you know, was this your aspirations as a child to become an author or an educator? Or did you know, like, we, you know, we ask kids all the time, what do you want to be when you grow up? Did you uh-huh. know when you were younger or a child, this is what you wanted to be? That's a very funny question, especially in this setting or at this time, because yesterday I had the opportunity to go to what is now E.B. E. B. Morse Elementary School. And when I attended back in 78 and 79, it was a third and a fourth grade school, and I attended, it was called the Lawrence Grammar School, but it was between third and fourth grade. In fourth grade, I definitely knew that I wanted to be a teacher. I didn't know, I had not identified what type of teacher I wanted to be. It wasn't until I was in 11th grade in an AP Honors English class that I said, you know, I really enjoy this. I can do this all day long when it comes to reading and writing, speaking and working on those oral and verbal communication skills. And so I did. I followed up. I went to Clemson, majored in education, stuck with the English, became an English teacher for 11 years before I journeyed into administration. I also led the journalism club, teaching and growing other writers. And that was a treat as well. So I taught every level of English that there was, every grade level of English at the high school. So that was definitely something that I loved. I always had in the back of my mind that I wanted to write and to publish, to actually be an author. Didn't know when that would happen. School and um, the academic life kept me so busy because of the day jobs and then the night jobs and, and often the weekend jobs. So as far as sitting down, actually publishing, I didn't think that that would come until I actually retired. But I did start a few years before I uh, retired. I retired semi-last 
um, June. And so now I'm working a couple days a week. But on those days that I'm not I'm in schools, I'm reading and sharing my books with students. And I'm also helping other people publish. So I'm still very busy at this point. That is outstanding. And you were saying earlier about in terms of those of us who are educators and teachers, we are that because you were talking about how busy we are in terms of trying to do something else. And we are, believe it or not, educators. And I know, you know, I'm saying this from my listening on 24 seven. There really is. I mean, they honestly, I mean, people really and I always caution people whenever they come at me with that. I want to be a teacher because I'm going to be off in the summers and and get off at three o'clock and have all these days <laughs> off and all that kind of stuff. And I said, if that's why you're going into it, don't go into it. Cause it's not no, that. It, it sounds good. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> it sounds good, but it's really not that you are an educator 24 seven. So like when you take on the additional responsibilities or, or interests, like you were saying, yeah, I mean, it's, it can be done. Don't get me wrong. It can be done. But, but if people think, well, I'm going to do teach, because of the time it's going to allow me to do things, you might want to give that another thought because you really are never off as a teacher. And, and, and it's interesting because my, my route into education was, was circuitous. It was, it was around about certain detours before I finally got back to it, which was always my first passion to begin with. And, uh-huh. But it's been a wonderful ride, and language arts is what I taught as well. So it's interesting because my whole thing, this is where, because this show has been on the air this is the 18th season now, since 2001, and it was created to help generate, hopefully, a love for reading or more of an interest in reading in the general public. Okay. And I am a firm believer, and I've always been a firm believer, that reading is the foundation for every other subject, for everything else. That you have to be able to read and comprehend well in yeah. order to really be successful in all the rest of the subjects as well. And interestingly enough, last week... My guest was an educator as well. She was a reading specialist who's now written a child's a children's book as well. So let's talk a little bit about, you know, writing children's books and, and how they're received when you walk into the classroom. And or, or do you get a chance to, to present or service students that you've had or that know you? Because every time I've always taken authors to my building and the kids see the picture of the author on the book and the person standing right in front of them, they lose their minds. <laughs> I mean, it's like I, like they can't believe they they can see the person standing in front of them who's actually the author of the book. <laughs> uh huh. Well, and I do receive some of that. Sometimes a, the class will pass me, and one child will will reach back and say, "Are you famous?" And so yesterday, <laughs> the question that the media specialist overheard was, "Is she rich?" So I began <laughs> my presentation by explaining. No, I'm not famous, and no, I'm not rich. I am doing what I really enjoy, so if you don't count money, I'm extremely rich. Um, And so don't, you know, assume because people have published and have books that they are rich. Now, if you're Dr. Seuss or if you've written Diary of a Wimpy Kid, then that may be a different different thing. But, (laughs) you know, royalties on books are just not great. So if you keep doing it, and you say, you know, you're earning, then perhaps you can get to some other level. But again, I had three jobs when I became an author. So the money was not the motivation, and it's still not. If I can get a, a book into a child's hand, right. then I am rich. I I, you know, I could not agree with you more. And it starts at the lower ages. Again, my guest last week Amber Lassiter, she's local from the area. She wrote a children's book, and we had this discussion last week as well in terms of engaging children at the youngest levels to getting them to take on a love for reading. Yes. And with the children's book, you have the opportunity to do that. Uh, and, and, and you know, again, at, at the little ages, they love going to school anyway. So the, the, yeah, that's right. It's only when they come up in the middle school and the high schools do they kind of turn to a, to a certain degree. <laughs> that's true. But at the lower grades, they really do love school. They just love being there. So if that's the time we're going to engage, and that's the time is to really get them into the whole notion of reading. Because a lot of times you get kids, I don't like to read. Reading is boring. This and that. I say, yeah, but you read on social media every day. You read text messages. You read Facebook. You read Snapchat. You read Instagram. You're reading. Exactly. We just want to rechannel that a little. Exactly. And so it's interesting, too, that you say that because 
I actually walked into the media center of the school that I attended, like I said, in third and fourth grade. And I still remember some of the stories that the media specialist read all the way back then. And those were the stories that got me hooked to say, you know, liter- literacy and, and literature, they're phenomenal. And if I could, I would read every book in this library. I remember saying that back then. But when I started, I wasn't a fluent reader. Uh-huh. It was a few years before I really gained that fluency because I just did not have the books that I really wanted to read. And so I say, as many other educators say as well, if you're not enjoying reading, if you're not reading fluently, it's because you just have not found the, the right book. And I saw a post on your LinkedIn um, page that I, w- I can't wait to go back and may use a few of the points in my blog for the week, how to engage reluctant readers to read more. Um, I think that's a great article. Um, Thank you. Yes, and so I, I really plan to spend some time with that. No, because that is that is my passion. The reading, writing, speaking, thinking areas, those are my passions. Not to say that I don't like math, but it's just my passion is more on the other side. It's on that reading side. That's where it's always been. And mm-hmm. I was sharing, and I've shared with the audience before, and, it, it, and for parents, it's so important for you to model reading for your children. Yes. If, like if, because for me, that's what didn't. I didn't do it for my sister, but it did it for me. I, I saw my father every afternoon whenever he'd come home from work, sit down and read. And I started doing the same thing uh-huh. and took on a love for my, it from there. Uh huh. My father used to read bedtime stories to us, and it was just the best time of the day. We absolutely loved that. He was very good at finding something humorous, and we just giggle until we fall off to sleep. And those were great times as well. Our parents bought plenty of books. We right. had, we, our home was literacy rich literary rich. And that was the commitment that I had to my son when he was growing up. You know, video games, you have to earn those, and we're going to limit how many of those we purchase. But books, you can have all the books that you want. And I remember when he fell in love with the Magic Treehouse books. Right. And it was an expensive habit because he had to get it as soon as it came out. And so that meant buying the hardback. (laughs) And so at one point I was like, really? Because he would read it, and then it, he was done with it. And I'm like, wow, we might need to rethink this. But still, I had an unlimited budget on books. He was reading, and I was very happy. So um, he started his library very early. And that's one of the things that I enjoy uh, helping parents do now. Just make sure you have that reading center, that reading corner. What that may look like is a small shelf with, you know, all the books you can get on it that are age-appropriate, content-appropriate, and a very comfortable seating area. Maybe there's lighting so that if they read into the evening. But I have a fun memory of my family. There was a um, storm. The power had gone out, and my um, daughter, my stepdaughter, and my son and one of my son's friends were home, and they were like, well, what do we do? My husband and I were already reading And so we um, told our children, go find a book. And they did. They came back, but they giggled for, you know, probably the first 10 minutes. Like, is this real? Are they really (laughs) making us all sit here? No, it feels But then, you know, after about an hour, everybody was lost into their own content and just really having a ball. And I couldn't take anything for that moment and wish, you know, that not that I want to lose power, but it was just, you know, that was a special time because they knew just how much reading means to us. That that's absolutely right. And see, this is the thing. And I, in some in some respects, it's a hard sell, and then sometimes it's not. But we try to. I try to help everybody understand. Reading can take you places that you may not ever physically go. That you can exactly. sit there and read a book about Paris and and really feel like you're in Paris, or read a book about China and really feel like you're in China, or whatever scenarios the author has now presented to you, you can actually feel like you're there. I mean, for me, when I get engrossed in a book, it's just like watching a movie. I mean, I, I'm there. It's not uh-huh. even a matter of me sitting there with words in front of me. Like I'm in. I'm immersed in that scene. Exactly. And it's so relaxing, it's therapeutic, it does so much for the mind. And just, you know, if you're going through something or if you have lots of questions, just finding that information that really speaks to you at the moment. There are just so many attributes and qualities of reading that, you know, I just can't um, say enough. 
But there were so many experiences that I had as a young child, not only with my parents reading to me, but I enrolled, or my, my mother enrolled me and a cousin in a summer reading program, and it was called the Magical Mad Hatter's Reading Program at our local library. And we would go, and the librarians would be in costume, and everything in the library was on that theme. And we went for probably two to three weeks in the summer, but that was another opportunity for me to truly get immersed in and just absolutely love reading. It just did something for me that nothing else could do. I enjoyed and I love music, but it just music for me just does not have the power that reading has. Absolutely, um, I so understand. That, that got me hooked. It really did, and and that's something that that was one of the greatest gifts that my mother could have given to me to get me into that reading program. And so I really sought opportunities very similar to that for my son as well. So now, all right, when you're that age. And did the, okay, let me ask the question this way. Did the rest of your little friends at that age, were they readers too? Or were you kind of like the exception? In other words, a lot of times when you get a child that's the one who loves to read, they're teased, they're the bookworm, they're the nerd, they're the geek, they're this, that, and the other. Or were you hanging with a crowd of kids who that's what they did too, so it was nothing special? My first cousin and I were five months apart. We grew up together. She loved reading, and she had tons of books. So we were pretty much reading partners. My um, other friends, if they were readers, honestly, I don't know, because at that age, there wasn't a whole lot of hanging out outside of school. Okay. So I'm not sure, but, but that cousin and I matriculated all the way through AP English together, and often we were the only, you know, two, we were the, the closest two in there, and, and we looked like each other in most of the classes that we were in looked another way they didn't look like us okay and see Mm -hmm. this is the other thing i try to help folks understand in terms of the importance of reading in 2019 and where we're headed that if you really don't read and comprehend and, and and are able to do it relatively quickly you really are going to be left out in a society where for the most part we're moving towards a do it yourself everything and Yes. What I mean by that is when you go to the various checkout counters or go to the banks and everything, mm-hmm. the onus is mm-hmm. falling on you with a machine spitting words back at you. Exactly. And if you can't read and comprehend what those words are saying and asking you to do, you're going to be stuck. And I always use the example of the automated teller machines. They've become a lot more sophisticated than when they first were introduced. Uh, so. I have been behind people who I could tell could not read what was going on on that screen. And they were steady punching buttons and words were coming back to the point where they get frustrated and they just pull their card out. Because they, I mean, the, the automated teller machines now give you a whole lot more choices, options, and you have to really kind of maneuver your way through the buttons. And I've seen folks who didn't know what those words were saying. And I look and said, oh, my God, like, how do you function in life? break your heart. Right. It, it truly breaks your heart because even at the airport, there are, op- there are often opportunities where you have to use a little keypad to put in your meal. Right. You know, there's no one there to talk to. And so when I go into school and I talk to these young people, I say, you know, it is okay if you decide you want to be a cafeteria worker. If that's your goal, but you still need to be really working on your literacy skills because you have to read recipes. Correct. And if you decide that college isn't the career path for you, then BMW or Bosch or Michelin, they may have training programs where they can carry you right out of school, but you have to have excellent literacy skills. Because Correct. They will train you, but there's a lot of reading. There's technical literature that you really have to have a good comprehension of. So regardless, in this day and time, whatever it is that you want to do, you're going to do a better job and you're going to be more um, attractive to companies if you have good, strong, verbal, written, and um, literacy skills. That is correct. And that was a good point you made about the airport because you're absolutely right. As you travel through airports, more and more of that. I mean, if you travel internationally with your passports, you have to go to a kiosk for that. Uh, like you said, choose your menu. I mean, more and more areas and places are to the point now where they're being automated. But with that automation becomes your or your ability to read and comprehend has to be there. And it has to be somewhat quick. 
because people yeah. are going to be behind you. And that is a very good point that you just made as well. And even applying for a job, because a lot of times now the application process is at a computer. If you go into a, a department store or Target or whatever it is, Mm -hmm. They will have the the place for you to apply a job. They'll have a little booth there that you have to go in and, again, do it yourself. So you're yeah. absolutely right. And, but, and that's what you're trying to get people to understand. This is not just because I like reading and I'm wanting you to read. We're sharing this with you because we're trying to help make life better for you. Exactly. Exactly. And where I'm working my way up with this line of questioning in terms of your passion as a child and coming through and then is working our way to you're becoming an author and how did you decide where your ideas come from? But talk a little bit about before I even get there, how critical or how much of an aid was it whenever you were now pursuing your doctorate that you were a reader? Oh, wow. So when I was working on my doctorate degree, it was crucial that I read. When I decided on the topic that I would want my dissertation to be on, my focus, I found tons of articles that I had to sift through and read. There were some that were maybe close to the topic, and I had to sift through those, but I kept a huge notebook. This was probably the first five-inch binder I had ever bought. I never needed a notebook that big, but I had to go through and read all of that, but then just the course materials. In class, often the professor might expect you to come to school or to class already having read half the book. Correct. So you have to be very dis disciplined, but even with all the time in the world, you still have to be a quick reader. You have to know how to read for information and how to retain what is, you know, extremely important. So you need highlighters, you need paper that you can make and write down points, but going to going into um, higher education or going into the pursuit of a terminal degree, literacy is extremely important, whether it's writing the dissertation, and so doing all of the research for that, or just being able to keep up in the classes. Right. It is not for, you know, anyone with, le with weak literacy skills. Absolutely. And you just brought up a point, because there's different types of reading. Last week, we talked about the whole notion of within literacy and reading, there's uh -huh. decoding, there's fluency you just talked about, there's comprehension. But you just brought up another interesting point, and that is the different types of reading in terms of reading for information. Uh -huh. There's reading for pleasure, like your novels and all that. There's reading for information. And there is a difference. And that's a skill in and of itself. Like, okay, you're like with research, and I, I laugh because in this technological age, because we have Google and search engines and things like that, many of the students will go in there and whatever their topic is, I've had students go in there and keyword the topic, print out the information and come and say, here's my book report. So that's not your book report. <laughs> that's not your book report. That's a part of your research. You can't just keyword pull off print off the sheets and turn that in as your work <laughs> exactly exactly and i've encountered a lot of that easy of that as well the, the easy way or either just not having been taught right how to do it properly absolutely so your ideas for your children's were like i'm looking at these titles bj's big dream what is that stinky winky ew smell he never slumbers the ideas where do they come from Every single one of those is a story that happened actually to me. Those are my stories with the <laughs> exception of BJ's Big Dream. That is my son. I watched him from the time that he was in second grade all the way up to ninth grade. He wanted hair like Bob Marley. He was obsessed with it. And even though he had to start over almost every year between second grade and ninth grade, it wasn't until ninth grade that his hair actually locked the way he wanted it to, uh -huh. but he was not giving up. And I was, I learned from that. I said, if a child's mind can be that set and fixated on something that he wants, then I can use that recipe that he applied to teach children all over the world that if there's something that you want, if you desire it enough, if you have the patience and you have the faith, then there's not much that you can't accomplish. You just have to remain focused on it. 
So that was that was his story. But all of the others are mine, even though I may have changed the character, for example, and he never slumbers. That was me. I was overweight. I was bullied. And I changed the name to Caleb. I just like using family names. And right. Caleb is my paternal grandfather who I never met. So then when we get to what is that stinky, winky, ew smell, that was me at five years old, a very um, smart but manipulative five-year-old <laughs> who I didn't like defeat. I was competitive. So when I didn't win the Easter egg contest that year, I said, oh, I got something for them. I'll win next year. And I put my extra eggs in my closet. I said, they'll be here. <laughs> I can get a head start at the Easter egg hunt. And about a month later, if it was that long, my mother started coming in my room. What does that smell? Every night, what does that smell? What does that smell? And I didn't know. I, I didn't know that they would rot. Of course I didn't because I wouldn't have put them in there. But I had forgotten about them after all of that time. So finally, you know, my family had to truly pick or pull the, the closet apart. And they um, figured out what the problem was. I mean, it was horrible. Like, they thought it was either a dead snake or a dead rat. Right. And the, the fumes had even crept out of my room into the other part of the house. So um, we all learned, though, a very important um, lesson about, I learned about food safety, but we also learned that there are cultures that actually preserve boiled eggs. Right. So it, it just turned out to be, you know, a fun experience for the entire family. So now as you go around to the schools and you and you share with the children, again, as I was saying earlier, I mean, they really do. I, I laughed that you were saying the, they asked you the question, are you famous? I tease, especially those of us who are educators, I tease us all the time because in in some respects, as a teacher or an educator, you really are famous. I mean, it's like unbelievable. I always call us poor man celebrity because <laughs> it's like it's just like, you know, being a movie star, a rock star, a musician or whatever without the money. Uh, in terms of, but there is nowhere you can go where you don't run into a student or a former student. And I literally mean nowhere. It just happened to me yet again yesterday. I go into a Taco okay. Bell that uh-huh. <laughs> that is not necessarily near my house. It just happened. I, I was in the area, popped in. Kid looks at me and I'm wondering why, you know, cause now I'm wondering, you know, is something wrong? Because I walk in the restaurant and they all give me this look. Mm-hmm. And so the kid and I had on my you know, Air Force jacket, I had on my military jacket that had my last name on there. So as I walk up to the counter, he says, oh, my God, I thought it was you. And then when you mm-hmm. walked up to the counter with the jacket and saw your last name, you were my principal. <laughs> and, I, and I look at the kid. I'm like, oh, OK. And I'm like, which school now? And as, as it turns out, it's the school I'm presently in. It was like four or five years ago. I'm uh-huh. like, oh, always glad to see my students working. But I mean, literally, I mean, nowhere you can go when you don't run. And I know as you as an assistant superintendent and principal and everything, I know the same happens in terms of no matter where you go, a parent or a student or somebody, you know. That's true. So in a that sense, I always say we, we do. We are famous in our own little ways, just not like on the big screen. <laughs> uh-huh. That is true. And that is, um, you know, is a special part of it when you go somewhere, like you said, and somebody comes up because if there were terrible experiences, then they're probably not going to come up. And so when that happens, apparently you did something right. There was something special or something significant that that person is remembering. And as I'm getting older, it's more difficult to remember because I started teaching in 1991 and did student teaching even before that. And while my career ended after the 4th District here in the upstate. All of the counties that I taught in actually connect and touch each other, but um, I, anywhere I go in the upstate, I'm bound to run into somebody and to meet someone, and it's it's just great when yeah, it really all of is. you plant it. Yes, they do grow, and to actually see the fruit of your labor, it really makes a big difference. Even yesterday, I had a former student come up to me and say, you know, and then I also had children that came up and said, my mom gave me this money and she just really wants me to have one of their books and she wants you to autograph it to me and she wants me to take a picture with you and if you can send it to her, she'll be very happy. 
and that just really touches your heart. You know, it really does. It really does. One of the one of the questions I asked the young man yesterday, I said, okay, because he's about 19, 20 now. So I said, all right, now that you're grown, does any of the things that we used to say to you back then, does it now <laughs> ring true for you? He says, oh, mm-hmm. yes. He says, matter of fact, there are times when I think back to those eighth grade assemblies you had. <laughs> I said, oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> but I got a big kick out of that. I said, aha. Well, that's great. And, you know, and, and it's not that often that, you know, someone will that quickly tell you exactly the impact. And my guess and suspicion is that was premeditated. That wasn't just because you asked. Right. He'd already been thinking about those. Those were shaping his, lives and his life. And he was saying to himself, you know, maybe I didn't enjoy them so much then but now i see right and those are the messages that i enjoy receiving no i couldn't agree with you a matter of fact with working with kids a lot of times when you really think that they're not listening to you they are uh-huh. they are mm-hmm. and because again i had an experience the other day i'm always i'm big on telling the kids look i'm not spending two hundred dollars on a pair of sneakers i've never spent two hundred dollars on a pair of shoes let alone a pair of sneakers so a anyway, kid breezes through uh, with a very, really, really nice pair of Nikes that I liked and the colors that I like, black and gold. I said, yo, okay. I said, you know, where, where'd you get those from? I want to get those sneakers. And, and, you know, I said, next time I get my sneakers, I think I'm going to get that pair. And so uh-huh. he tells me the story he got in front of me. And I said, well, I can tell you right now. So another kid overheard the conversation. He said, yo, Mr. Metal, you said you, you, I thought you said you don't get Nikes or any of those. <laughs> and I said, wait a minute. He said, yeah, I've heard you say that a few times. I said, you were listening? <laughs> <laughs> you you were listening to that speech when I was telling you all not to spend that much money on a pair of snakes. Yeah, okay, all right. You all do listen. <laughs> that is funny. But they that do. Really so I'm looking through your website. I see O to be a bulldog. Now, again, that's the mascot at my school. We're the Napier Academy Bulldogs. And I oh, see awesome. O to be a bulldog, South Carolina State University. And I see you have a coloring book as well. Yes, exactly. So I wanted to do a mascot book, and I also attended Clemson University twice. Clemson University has several children's books. I was inspired by the the book for USC or the University of South Carolina. They have a book by two former football players who actually played in the pros. It's called Hashtag Just a Chicken. And so um, I decided because South Carolina State University – doesn't have didn't have at the time a children's book and I said you know it would be awesome to create a book that can not only get hopefully all children thinking and planning and and excited about college but it can really put South Carolina State University on the map for many children in the state of South Carolina Clemson and Carolina are huge those are the rivals and if you know anything about colleges you know those too Correct. And at South Carolina State University and some of our um, other HBCUs may not get that same level of attention and recognition. So I go into schools even very close to Orangeburg, where South Carolina State University sits. And the tragic and the sad thing is that some of those students, even though they live within a stone's throw, they have not been on to the campus right. of South Carolina State University. So I really try to take the children there. When I go in and I do a presentation, I say, you don't have to close your eyes, but I really want you to imagine that you are in the car and you are driving onto this campus for the very first time. I've tried to create for you lots of sights, lots of sounds, lots of things that you will hear, and perhaps there are things that you could even pretend that you're tasting. So I try to engage all of the senses and truly give them a vicarious experience so that they, in the back of their minds, if they've never been, they say, I have to do that one day. Somebody has to take me to a college campus so that I can experience that. And maybe one of the things that I don't do so well, because I'm not a great sports fan, it's, you know, maybe a little recreational for me, but I don't have a team that I just, you know, really, really, really follow. My son played for years. My husband coached, and so I was always there in the stand. But um, I can't say that, that sports is my forte, but I like everything that goes on around it. And so that kind of comes out in the book where I don't really go into the details of the football game. 
I do talk about the players warming up. I talk about the, the game beginning. I talk about the game ending. But I focus on the band a little bit more because the Marching 101 is extremely well known, and they bring so much excitement to the game. Sometimes people travel to see the band. Right. And when it comes to battle, battles of bands, That's right. they, if, if they don't win, they're very, very close to the top. And we're talking about a marching sensation that – has historically been a marching sensation. So I began with that, um, the tailgating, the cheerleaders, the dancers, even the airmen who fly in um, because it is a a military school where military uh, officers are produced. So I just try to bring all of that in. But then I go to a little, the story is is of a little boy who with his dad for the very first time, but he decides he's going back as an adult or as a, a college student but he also puts in plan a place that a plan into place that he wants to take the mascot with him. He falls in love with the bulldog mascot, and then he and his parents come up with a somewhat informal contract where there are some things he has to do and get in order, and then they will get him his own bulldog. He raises the bulldog, and then they go back to stay together. They roommates, partners, peers, but. The dog is the bulldog mascot for the school, and then, of course, he's an engineering student there. So just a story to really get the children in, and, and, and then I say, look at what Caden has done. How did he do it? What does that mean for you? But what I want them to see is, if, even if you're in second grade, third grade, fourth grade, fifth grade, it's not too early to, to develop a plan. And I explain to them just how quickly those years will pass. So... Figure out what it is that you really enjoy doing. And then when you go to work in years to come, it won't seem like work. Because right now, as an author and as a publisher, I spend hours and hours either on the road or in front of my computer, on the phone with clients. But it really doesn't seem like work because I'm just that passionate about it. So I had a really good life when I got my first um, check as a teacher I was at the same school that I had just graduated from three years prior to. Wow. I would walk through the cafeteria, get my lunch, and every day I would have to argue, no, you don't charge me the student price, you charge me the adult price. And I was, you know, that honest ape type of person. But after about a month of that arguing, I just said, you know what, whatever you charge me, that's what I'm going to pay. <laughs> um, but it was so fun being back in that setting and I just felt like, you know, I never graduated. I'm just this is just a continuation. And I I was, you know, forever in school, not just during the day in my day job. I went to school myself to get my master's, to get my doctor doctorate. But then as soon as I finished that then I was teaching at night. Right. So that, like you said, you don't stop because often on Saturdays I would even be in pajamas teaching online. Right. Always trying to give back and help that next generation get there. But still, again, here I am in schools, a different capacity, right. reading books to young people, trying to give them some inspiration, encouragement, and just be positive, but help them go ahead and start setting some healthy goals for who they want to become. Absolutely. Let me tell you why this idea or this book that you put together with South Carolina State on there is such a good one. And I just posted both both books on my Facebook page in oh, terms of this is what I tell a lot of the teachers that I work with all the time in terms of our language. When in our minds, we're assuming that the children and parents, for that matter, know what we're talking about in terms of when we start talking college language, like degrees and majors and matriculation and grade point averages and doctorates and masters. We assume that the audience we're talking to knows what we're talking about. And that may not necessarily be the truth. And that's why the message may get missed. It may go right over their heads because we might as well be speaking Chinese or Japanese. They don't know what you're talking about when you say degree. They don't know when you say college campus. They don't know when you say major or professor. That's not language that that they're accustomed to. So whenever you're constantly speaking to them about, all right, I want you to go to college. All right, boys and girls, we're trying to get you ready for college. All right. They don't know what we're talking about. So when you have a book like this that's starting down in the kindergarten, first, second grade level, you begin to weave that vocabulary into their life. So now when they look at a book like this, you know, when you start talking about things going on on a college campus, it won't be foreign to them. 
And that is completely my goal. It truly is. And I actually had a list of college vocabulary. I had a glossary. It didn't make it because I also wanted to include the alma mater. I also wanted to include um, some facts about the school. And so the glossary didn't make it. But when I do have enough time during my presentation, you know, we talk about so many of those things that, you know, children, if you're not growing up in a home where parents, you know, are constantly talking and engaging you in those conversations, right. then you're truly missing it. And we do make a lot of assumptions that just are not true. No, we do. I get a, a child into my office and I'll start talking master's degrees and bachelor's and all that. And they're looking at me like I have three heads. Then I'll have to mm-hmm. back it up and, and like, OK, let me help you understand what this is, what we're talking about here. But I would think any school would be thrilled to have a book with their name. Like I'm looking at the South Carolina State University and I love the cover and everything that's going on on there because it's representative of all the different activities. I see the military there. I see the athletics. I see the uh, school queen. Uh, the mascot, the bulldog itself, I see the looks uh-huh. like a gym class or a dance class or either something or sorority or something they're doing there uh, uh-huh. up there. So it's reflective because on the coloring book, I see the band and the mascot and the pencils and everything. So it's very reflective of things that they would think about in terms of the college experience. And interestingly enough, this studio sits on the campus of a, a university here in northern New Jersey, and my school is less than two miles away from it. I could walk there on a good day. And I have my students and families that live there, just like you said, less than a mile, two miles away and have never been up here. Some don't even know this university exists, and they're right down the hill from it. Wow. Yeah. It's, yes. And And that's my thing, too. I reached out to the superintendent in Orangeburg to say, I know South Carolina State sits right there in the heart of your community, but I guarantee you, and I know they know as well, that there are students just right around that campus who have never really been there for an event or activity to know all of the great things that go on in that they can be encouraged to know that that it's not a foreign place to them. They can go there one day. You know, it just takes starting young and having that confidence, but working on those literacy skills that we've been talking about. Absolutely. And see, I'm big on connecting the dots. And that's because it's one thing for a child to have to come to school because you have to come to school. It's another thing to come there with a purpose. It's another thing to say, you know what, I know I want to learn this or I'm going to get this because I want to do this. Uh, That's whenever learning, I think, for anybody, like you were saying, your son with the determination to get his hair locked. Uh, I Uh think the, the determination for anyone is whenever they can connect the dots. I'm going to do this so I can become and do that. I'm going to I want I need to do this so I can live out my passion. I think when kids can connect, because it's kind of like for me with algebra, when am I ever going to use this again? You know, it's once you can get kids to understand this is where you're going to use this again. Mm-hmm. You will have you will have a connection there now and, and you'll have a kid that wants to be at school, wants to do everything, wants to do the reading and the research and so on. But if the kids can't connect why they're doing what they do, they're kind of like, oh, I'm just doing this. They're, they're complying. Exactly. And that's one of the things that I try to do with the children. I, I talk about because Caden, before he can get his bulldog, he has to do his chores, clean his room, and his parents require him to make all A's. And so I talk about that, that maybe they have a goal, and hopefully whatever it is they want, that their parents won't just give it to them, right. they can make them earn it. But I tell them, when you do these things, when you listen to your teachers, when you're obedient in school, when you go home and do your homework and you're studying, you're just trying to soak up everything you can, that makes it easier for middle school. Then that makes it easier for high school. That makes it easier for college. What you're doing now is working on the foundation and everything that you do every day, even though you may not see the importance and and why your teacher is so adamant that you have to do it this way or you have to do this, you're building that foundation. And the more you comply and do your very best now, the easier it's going to be. You're building those habits that you don't want to start learning how to read or to um, begin doing your homework in your, when you're in middle school because you're so far behind by then right. that it would be very difficult to catch up. 
and habits are more difficult. The older you go, as we know, the more difficult it is to make good habits that we haven't worked on when we were very young. That's absolutely right. That's why I love this idea of you introducing this coloring book and this book about college. Because I know one of the things that I've done in my schools that I've led is I've had all, and even on my door, on my office door, I've had all the teachers put whatever college they went to to go see if they can get the flag, like the little felt banner or whatever, some kind of representation, and they put that on their doors. And I would tell Uh them that whatever college you went to, your classroom has now become that university. Again, trying to introduce the language to the kids. And again, I don't have a problem with telling kids, like you said earlier, everybody doesn't have to go to college. And people sometimes get, you know, they get kind of old. They look at me like, but you're, no, no. College doesn't have to be for everybody because there's a lot of careers out there that don't require college. It's a trade. Then you still have to learn that and you still need your Uh education for whatever that trade is. But Mm -hmm. uh, in terms of at least helping kids understand what is this thing called college? What is this thing? I I think that's a great idea there. And, And you're absolutely right in terms of sharing the experiences with the children. And something you just said, I was telling people over the last week, I downloaded a book. It's the title is something along the lines of raising grateful children in an entitlement world. Hmm. And exactly what you were just talking about in terms of earning, like, well, no, wait a minute. There's reasons we're asking you to do this. Yes. Because you know, you know, we're not always going to be in this handout society. You need to earn, but that's what that, that book title captured my attention because I was like, Oh my God, that's what I'm dealing with every day. I'm dealing with a whole, my, some of my, even my personal kids included, like they're in this entitlement world, feel like they're entitled to everything. So your book that you were just talking about, is right on point in terms of helping them understand why they want to do what their parents say or their teachers say or whatever. So it sounds like your books are great discussion starters with the kids that a teacher could take your book and have a really good discussion regardless of the age group. I have received that feedback. And as an educator, as a person that's very passionate for children, about children and books as well, every one of my books is the, the purpose is to teach students some type of character traits or attributes that will be extremely helpful to them in their lives in their lives and so i've tried to use a character that they can relate to pictures that they can relate to something that just may grab their attention and just you know it it's gone extremely well i truly wouldn't take anything in the world for the last um, three and a half year journey that I've had publishing and having the opportunity to get into schools, churches, community organizations in front of children and hopefully turning on a light bulb at some point for someone so that they say, you know what, I'm going to do this. I can do this. And and they began to read. So what was that like for you? Because I'm assuming author came before publisher. And maybe that's a bad assumption, but all right. So what was it like now to make the leap from being, okay, I was a teacher, author. Now I'm going to be a publisher. What, what was that like? Well, the author came, I was actually at a gas station one day and one of my good friends called me and said, Did you want to, don't you want to publish your book? Because I had written a book that I was sitting on for many years. It takes lots of time to find a publisher. Right. And so, you know, you, you really have to read and really study, network, talk to people, really figure out what's going on in that industry, which is which was completely foreign to me, in order to even get someone to respond to you via email or, or call you back. Well, Vanessa Miller is a best selling Christian author who now lives in Charlotte and she has been writing for many, many years, very successful author. She said she knows she's not going to do this forever, so she wanted to meet some other authors or people aspiring that she could walk through the process and teach how to get into publishing, and she was completing an anthology. So I divided my book into two parts, and we published the first part of it in one of her her anthologies and the second part in another, uh, a, a sequel anthology, And I said, "Uh uh-huh, this is it, because (laughs) she walked us through the the steps, and I said, I can do this. So these children's books, ideas that I have, I can do these. So after the second anthology was published, shortly thereafter, I published BJ's Big Dream, and that went well, so I went ahead and did Stinky Winky, and then I went ahead and did He Never Slumbers. A year later, I did My Friends Lived in the Outlets, but when it got to um, Oh, to Be a Bulldog, because Mascot Books 
is well known and they've um, established a really good tradition of publishing mascot books, uh-huh. they're able to legally walk through that step of making a book a co- collegiate official book. Right. And I, of course, wanted that stamp. So I said, you know, I think I'm going to um, get some help with this one and, and let them help me. And, and that's been great because they give you, you know, even a boost with marketing and all of that. Um, and so I went with them. But last year, last well, actually, March, it was two years ago that I published a book for a cousin. And she loved it so much, I just finished publishing a second book for her. And so with those five that I have listed on my website, I just put out another three and just got contracts for three additional books. And I am just in heaven because that's what I enjoy doing, sitting in front of a computer, editing, laying it out, formatting it, choosing the cover. And I don't tell the authors when their draft copy is going to come in the mail because I want them to just go and be surprised. Right. And it's, it's just something about actually seeing it. You know, yes, you indeed. Vision, but then to see it and to hold it. That's a whole nother world. So I, I want to give people the gift that was given to me, and that was the gift of publishing. Absolutely. And it's funny you bring that up because that is another one of my standard questions as well, even though I don't have standard questions, but that is one that usually gets worked in. And that is when you open that box with your work, with your name on it and your art and everything, and you kind of alluded it to it. What was that like? Because you're absolutely right. When you get something that was that you produced, that God produced through you, and, and now it comes back in the delivery box and you open it, and whether it's a book or whatever, it is an incredible feeling. Now, I always share this as a male, even though I was at the birth of both of my kids, I was there. I literally saw them come into the world. Uh-huh. I equate that feeling of opening that box of books or whatever to giving birth to a child. <laughs> it is. It is the next best thing. I would right. truly say that. Yes. And it's official. I am truly an author, really, you know, to add that to all of my many other titles. But that is a very special one. And I can't even really explain it. We right. had a little girl in our district a few years ago when she got her Dolly Parton imagination books out of the mailbox. Um, she would say, party in the mailbox, party in the mailbox. <laughs> and so that's what it feels like. Party at your front door, party at the box, because we're getting ready to celebrate. This is a big moment. So that, It, that's it really happening. is. It is. And everybody I've asked that question to, they've answered in a different way, but they all say it is really, you can't put it into words of what it you feels can't. like. It's Even like, an author with a huge vocabulary it's very difficult to right. pinpoint. You know, you just can't, you can't explain it. So it was interesting to hear you say, I don't let them know because I want it to be a surprise. I want it, Yes, that I know exactly <laughs> what you're talking about. And I think you also answered, because I was going to ask you the question too, in terms of the name for the company, Hadassah's Crown. But so it, you, you took that over or did you name it? I named it. My, I have a, a mother-in-law who, often refers to me as Esther from the Bible because right. she says, you are the savior of our people. And that meant so much to me that I decided to use um, Esther's Hebrew name and create Hadassah's Crown Publishing. See, I tell you, I really I love it because like it. everything in here is kind of like a method to your madness. Everything has significance. There's a reason, but it's not just by happenstance. There's reasons behind everything. The title of your books, the title of the publishing company. I'm looking here as an educator, you know, we're very observant, but I'm looking at your video, the one with BJ's Dream on it. I see a Delta symbol in the back. Is that your office? <laughs> yes, so, I, I, so that makes me, that leads me to believe you're a Delta. <laughs> That is exactly right. Yes, my both of my daughters are Deltas. <laughs> I'm an Alpha, and they both went Delta. Delta. <laughs> <laughs> they chose well, very well. I know you're proud. <laughs> I am. They they both pledged down at another HBU uh, BCU at Dell State, at Delaware State. Oh. They pledged down there. Well, that is so interesting. My stepdaughter attended there, I believe, for two years before she transferred and came back down south. But she had a great experience, and I, I really enjoyed visiting the campus because it did really remind me of South Carolina State University. Yes, so yeah, they they both both of them went there. They're they're about five years apart, but they both they each graduated from Dell State, and the youngest one is is actually down in the Virginia area in Alexandria, that Washington D.C. area. 
Uh, so, okay. so when I saw that there, I said, okay, she's a Delta, unless <laughs> she's in somebody else's office, which I don't think she is. <laughs> <laughs> Daddy, me all the way. Please tell my son our hello, and just maybe one day our paths will cross. I will do just that. Matter of fact, the youngest one is on LinkedIn, too. Her name is Niara, N-I-A-R-A. And okay. her last name is Medley, M-E-D-L-E-Y. So, you know, she's she's on LinkedIn also. You can look her up there. I'll have her look you up one way or the other. But, yes, you all can can get together as sorority sisters. Yes, indeed. <laughs> awesome. Awesome. I love making those connections. So, all right, we are now down to the end of our interview or getting near the end of it. And what I do at this point is I allow my guests to promote and they can say anything with the exception of the dollar amount. But anything short of that or beyond that, any book signings, I I noticed your event page. And thank you for posting this morning on there under your events. Uh, Anything you'd like to share with the listening audience, how to contact you, your website, anything you'd like, anything except the cost. Uh, okay. you are, I'm going to shut the mic off and allow you to do just that. Awesome. Well, Mr. Medley, I'd just like to say thank you so very much. When I saw that your show was the Reading Circle, I'm like, that. I, I'd love to be there. Reading Circle, that's just me. And I appreciate this opportunity. You've been a very great, um, wonderful person to interview and talk with, and I appreciate the connection. My books, all of them, are available on o2beabulldog.com. Or you can also go to SonyaCunninghamLeverett.com. I also am available for book signings, coming to schools. Um, if you need book sales pricing for that, just contact me. You can contact me at HadassahsCrown at gmail.com. Again, books and children, those are my passions, and I plan to share those gifts and those desires with the entire world. So, I look forward to connecting with you. Thank you for listening. Well, I have enjoyed speaking with you, as I said, in the early part of the interview, educator to educator, but also as book lover to book lover or reader to reader or what have you, because, again, it is critical. And listening audience, her website, you can go to it, is her name, www.sonia, S-O-N-I-A, Cunningham, C-U-N-N-I-N-G-H-A-M, Leverett, L-E-V-E-R-E-T-T-E dot com. And as she said, it's Hadassah's Crown Publishing, LLC. And again, I love your website. I just redid mine literally like over the last month or so. I had one uh-huh. a few years ago. I um, had it for years and then I let it drop and finally put another one together. Had a lot of fun doing that and just a lot. And so now I'm looking at folks' websites as I, as I interview and, and speak <laughs> with them just to kind of see how things are set up. But I just dropped mine, like I said, a couple of weeks ago. And I real kind of doing it. And this one, this one really looks good. I love the way the color and the videos and everything else that's on here. But again, listening mm-hmm. to us, I encourage you to go there. It is SoniaCunninghamLeverett.com. You'll see her photo there. Dr. Sonia C. Leverett, educator, author, speaker, publisher. The two books we were just talking about in terms of the university down there in South Carolina. Videos are there and you can work your way through uh, the bio section, services, events, blogs, and the store. So I encourage you to do that because we do want you to support our guests that come on the show. So if you're an educator in a school, if you think her books can help you, by all means, order. I will be looking into that possibility myself because I really love these. uh, I love all of the titles. I never know. You never know. I may get one of each (laughs) one of them or more. But this South Carolina University one, like I said, it sends a message. And to my like second graders or third graders, it would be great if I could get a copy of that into their hands. They, another thing, you know, about learning is you can learn and have fun. People don't think that fun and learning go together. They think learning has to be drudgery. Uh, exactly. So my little ones could get, get that coloring book and don't even realize they're learning. <laughs> exactly. exactly. And that's my purpose. I try to sneak it in. Exactly. That's right. <laughs> Sneak it in is right. So thank you so much for joining me this morning. I do record the shows. And what I do is I have a YouTube channel that I put all the for those who chose not to get up early with us. <laughs> they, they have an opportunity to go back and catch the interview on my YouTube channel. They won't they you know I, I put pictures and everything that kind of works like a slideshow, but they get to hear it. So awesome. I'll put that up. I'll send you the link and you can do whatever you want with that. I'm behind my last couple of shows. I still have to do plus today. So sometime in the next few days, I'll email it out to you. And once you get it, it's yours. 
great. Thank you so much. And be careful up there in that snow. Oh, I sure will. Thank you so much. I intend to do just that. I'm going to leave here and go home now. I have to go shovel and all that kind of good stuff. <laughs> but, <laughs> but it looks like it stopped. I'm hoping it stopped. <laughs> but, I hope so. So you do the same and I'll be in touch. Great. Thanks again. Have uh, a wonderful day. Thank you. You too. Okay. All right.